He was a morbidly obese surgeon destined for an operating table and an early death. Now he's a rebel MD who is fabulously fit and fighting to make America healthy again. This is Stay Off My Operating Table with Dr. Philip Ovedia. All right, folks, welcome back. It's the Stay Off My Operating Table podcast with Dr. Philip Ovedia. I'm your uh, talking hairdo. By the way, Phil, have you noticed my hair is getting better? It is. It must be that carnivore diet. <laughs> That's it. Let's go with that. Um, I'm Jack Heald, and we are joined today by uh, a, a, another surgeon, which I think is pretty cool. Phil, introduce our guest for us, and let's get this conversation started. Yeah, really excited to have uh, Carlos uh, Moyera on with us today. Um, he is a fellow surgeon who is also working on keeping people off his operating table. Uh, and uh, we've been uh, interacting over on social media for quite a while now and uh, really excited to hear some of his uh, story and uh, some of what he's observed in um, his surgical world uh, as an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, Carlos, why don't you introduce yourself to our audience, give a little bit of your background, and then we can uh, dig into how you got into keeping people off your operating table. Well, and if I you. may, please explain what an orthopedic surgeon is. I know I should know this, but I've never had to deal with one. So I don't actually know what that is other than surgeries involved. Thank you, Dr. Vedia. Thank you, Jack. Uh, Carlos Moreira, I'm an orthopedic surgeon, like I said. Uh, an orthopedic surgeon is basically a surgeon that deals with the bones and the joints of the arms and the legs, uh, including hips. Uh, some of them do spine surgery as well with, with special training. Um, I got interested in uh, metabolic health and health optimizations uh, some years ago. I, I think uh, one of your previous guests, who, by the way, he says hello to both of you, uh, Dr. Sean O'Mara, he kind of got me into it. Uh, he first emailed me probably back about uh, maybe 2013, 2014, some uh, pictures of of, uh, of, uh, of MRI scans of one of his patients. And, and the most impressive thing, probably the biggest, the most important picture that I have ever seen in my educational, I mean, in my medical education or my medical career. And it was basically uh, an MRI scan where it showed that there was a completely occluded artery in the brain in one of his clients. And that after seven months, that uh, artery was completely wide open. Uh, and, uh, you know, and he did it just through natural interventions, you know, diet changes, lifestyle changes, no medications. And I thought to myself, well, that is amazing. You know, like that's, that's not even using kind of medications, you know, statins or whatever. Uh, so it kind of got me interested. Now he's really been like full force of that. I've been kind of, you know, on and off for several years, you know, until maybe about, four years ago and you know I was beginning to I was like you know put in some weight and my knee was bothering me a little bit more uh I had an osteochondral lesion in my knee and that's basically a lesion of like a bone involving bone and cartilage we don't call it a fracture but it's almost like a little crack inside your joint uh and so you know I, I felt about I need to really do something about it and plus I, at that time I was starting a new uh, full-time practice and so I had some uh, dietary instructions that one of my uh, professors in residency, I did my residency at Temple University Hospital in Philadelphia. Uh, his name was Dr. John Kelly. And uh, I had the instructions that he used to give to some of his patients. But, you know, that was already like, you know, 10 years ago. And so I talked to my friend, Sean. Hey, Sean, what do you think about this? about these instructions like, well, you know, some of this stuff is good. These are all the things I would not recommend. Maybe do this instead. And uh, I started just writing my own instructions for my patients. Uh, and basically over the next like two, three years and just continue to make modifications and, and just kind of got more into it. I, I saw some changes myself in my own health during the pandemic. Uh, I lost 
about 20 to 25 pounds. Uh, you know, during a time when like, you know, it seems like most people were actually gaining weight because they were like staying indoors and not, 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 not getting sun, not being active and so forth. But I actually lost weight myself. And uh, at this point, I feel like I'm just never gonna look back to, you know, to the times of like being maybe overweight or having some chronic pain in my left knee or, or what have you. So that's how I, in a, in a nutshell, how I got started with this. Uh, so when I, when I hear a cardiac surgeon talk about metabolic health, it's pretty clear to me being a non-healthcare professional that if you're obese and you get rid of all that weight, that you're less likely to end up on the table of a cardiac surgeon. But it is not at all obvious to me how that affects someone ending up on the table of an orthopedic surgeon, other than there's just less weight on your legs. Is there more to it than that? Yeah, there's there's more to it than that. And I think uh, during my training, you know, medical school and training, I, I would have thought, oh, yeah, you know, maybe arthritis gets better if you just simply remove the weight. But I, it's, it's more than just weight because... If you were weight alone, then, you know, people who are big, tall, and really muscular, like Dr. Sean Baker, then they will be like screaming in arthritic, you know, in arthritis, in arthritic pain. And, you know, that's not really the case. Uh, what, I, what I've come to realize just by reading, you know, the literature myself on this subject, and not something that our board would expect us to know, or not something that would get taught in residency, but, you know, basically... I have had to look this up myself, is that there is an inflammatory component and that inflammatory component is primarily driven by diet. Um, now, I wouldn't say that it's all just diet alone. There, there probably are some other components as well as like mechanical alignment of the knee, uh, because if it were just inflammation from diet, I think that perhaps Patients who had a partial replacement of the knee will never do well. But some of them do well, uh, but quite a few of them don't do well. And then, and then they go on to have a revision where they go from a partial knee replacement to complete knee replacement or a total knee replacement. So but there's certainly a big dietary component. And, uh, and that's something that I've, I've had to kind of learn on my own. And, you know, it's just amazing, like, you know, finding... Uh, papers that talk about this, you know, for instance, one big paper that I came across in 2020 during the middle of the pandemic was a study out of China where they took cartilage cells from the joints that were getting resurfaced during knee replacement, and then they put them in tissue culture, and they find out that if you have high insulin levels, it induces inflammation. Like they, they took this tissue. Uh, from the knee and they cultured it and under insulin, high levels of insulin, it induced inflammation. Uh, then I think it was later that year, a study out of the University of Alabama in Birmingham, they found out on a randomized control trial that a low carbohydrate diet is better for decreasing pain and improving function than a low fat diet or a standard diet. And so now I have the basic science and I have the clinical data both showing that if you're trying to cut back in your carbohydrates, it will make you arthritic pain less and it would allow you to improve your function. So, now, but, you know, there's, and there's other articles that I come across too, simply, you know, stating similar things. Yeah. So, you know, given that we have uh, the, you know, we have this in the literature, um, why? Don't you think it's talked about more amongst, um, you know, your community, the orthopedic surgeons and the, the rheumatologists that are treating things like arthritis? Um, and, you know, we hear a lot about uh, the medications and, and many people will have seen, you know, the advertisements on TV, uh, you know, for uh, arthritis med medication. We have, you know. Uh, sort of the, we'll call them the next generation of medications that have come out in the past few years, uh, very expensive 
uh, medications that are targeting uh, things like arthritis. Um, and they're targeting uh, the immune system uh, and inflammation. And yet, you know, uh, again, we really don't talk about, well, maybe, you know, just changing your diet can eliminate that inflammation. That's, that's an excellent question. And, uh, you know, I, I think part of the answer is uh, can be explained by some of the roadblocks that I have faced myself in trying to do this. You know, um, you know, I was I was at a hospital working once where I started giving instructions um, on diet, low carbohydrates diet and eliminating vegetable oils and things like that. And uh, and this was a hospital that I was traveling to. You know, I, I do locums, I, I do locums uh, tenants, just like you do. You know, I travel to hospitals where they have like a critical need for for an orthopedic surgeon. And on the first trip back there, I, I needed, I, I had to have a meeting with with the dietitian, the head of dietitians, and uh, the the director of the food service and the vice president of the hospital because you know they were not really liking much what I was seeing in my instructions. It basically came down that, at, at least from their point of view, is that whatever I said had to be in accord with um, with standards that are accepted by the government uh, in, in, the, in terms of, uh, you know, a hospital that receives money from Medicare, then, then they, have to have, they have to abide by like USDA dietary guidelines. And so they didn't want me to say something that was like outside of that. So they told me, well, you know, you could talk in the office all you want, but at the hospital, we can't really have that because then, you know, we might have problems with reaccreditation. And uh, it wasn't Jake, it wasn't the Joint Commission, but they were being accredited by some other organization. Uh, and then at another hospital, uh, apparently some patients complain to to the, to the office of the medical staff that I'm like talking about diet and lifestyle and telling them that they don't need surgery when they, when they in fact, they do need surgery. Uh, so there is, there's even resistance from the patients themselves. And, and, and you know, that, that one is hard to, to, to overcome because if, if they don't really want to hear it, then you, know, you start getting your bad reviews and, you know, things like that. Uh, or they complain to, to, to the staff, I mean, to the medical staff for the hospital. Then the third one is, is just a conflict of interest. You know, um, particularly joint replacement surgeons, arthroplasty surgeons, uh, it's not in their interest to understand or to uh, promulgate uh, to their patients how to avoid surgery because they are making their money from doing a joint replacement. And, you know, I've, I've kind of followed the, the joint replacement literature for years. And many, many, many years ago, I, I used to even work for a joint replacement surgeon. And what I found out is that the literature, particularly for joint replacements, is heavy on articles dealing with money, reimbursement, uh, you know, all kind of the business aspect and the reimbursement aspect of, of joint replacement. But when it comes to, you know, decreasing pain from dietary changes, it's like almost non-existent. And so, and you know, they make, they, you know, they make their living from doing joint replacements. And I'm not saying that the, the surgery is not needed or it shouldn't be done. Uh, I do think though that there's just no drive for them to want to learn how to avoid having to do the surgeries on the patients. Because he goes yeah. against the livelihood. Exactly. Um, you know, uh, what would you estimate? So I've, you know, I've publicly said many times now that I believe that probably 90% of the heart surgeries that I do uh, could have been prevented if, you know, we were paying attention to metabolic health uh, and people were paying attention to that, you know, um, early enough in their life. Uh, what would your guess be as to, uh, you know, the percentage of the, you know, and let's just limit it to joint replacements, you know, knee and hip replacements, which are probably the two most common surgeries that you do. Uh, you know, what percent of those do you think we could avoid if we were paying attention to metabolic health? Um, 
probably depends how far back you want to go on the modifications for diet because I, I would say if I would say if all patients that are getting joint replacement, and this is a very rough guess, okay, but if all the patients that are getting joint replacements, if they would have made some drastic dietary changes five years prior to obtaining their surgery, uh, I would say the majority of them would, would avoid it. Uh, maybe it could be in the realm of maybe 60 to 75%, okay? Uh, that's a guess. Now, there's still other patients that have had you know, inflammatory arthritis from a younger age, but we can still make the argument that uh, a lot of these autoimmune disorders or maybe the great majority of them, who knows if all of them, uh, are really caused by some sort of dietary insult early in life. Even if it's juvenile rheumatoid arthritis or, or what have you. Um, and so if you were to have you know, a completely clean diet from the get-go, uh, I would say that at least 90% of the joint replacements would be avoidable. Uh, the only time when you might have run into issues where like, well, you know, patient is still relatively healthy, but you know, the joint is, is scaring a hard time. Maybe those patients that are suffering what is called post-traumatic arthritis, uh, which is really just like osteoarthritis, except that it happened after trauma. Uh, and that trauma could have been maybe a fracture on the knee that involves the articular surface, you know, that involves the cartilage. Uh, it could be uh, an ACL tear, anterior cushion ligament tear, and then they undergo reconstruction for that. But, you know, the, whether you do surgery for an anterior cushion ligament tear, it doesn't really decrease the incidence of, of arthritis. It actually just simply helps with stability of the knee, but if the surgery is not even done, a reconstruction of the ACL ligament is not done to avoid arthritis. And they can still get arthritis later on. Uh, you know, when I looked at the literature regarding like why they get arthritis, uh, I, I think the best guess is that it's probably due to the amount of force during the original impact. But I think probably surgical, you know, factors may come into as well. You know, if, if, if the surgery was not an easy one, if there is a lot of bone debris still floating around, that those could be factors. So I think in summary, I would say if diet changes are made early on, uh, you could probably avoid at least 90% of the joint replacements. Um, when you were talking about keeping people off of your operating table and just speculating as to why the the literature for orthopedic surgeons is so heavily focused on reimbursement rather than treatment, um, I, I couldn't help but think that even if everybody in America was eating well, we still play football. We still play basketball. Um, it seems like the uh, the market for orthopedic surgery, while it may get smaller, is certainly unlikely to go away as long as we continue to be uh, two-legged beasts that run around doing crazy things. And that led me to this question. Suppose you're an athlete and um, that whole business of, of, of dealing with the, the long-term stress on the joints, like professional basketball players, professional football players deal with, um, is just part and parcel of how you work. Will this dietary change in your opinion, or is there any literature that would indicate that you are less likely to suffer uh, either a traumatic in injury or long-term arthritis as a result of these diet, diet changes, even though you're involved in these high-impact uh, athletic events? Yeah, that, that's a tough one to answer. I, uh, I could only think that it could help, but how much help, it's, it's kind of unknown. And, you know, there's so many other factors as well, you know, it, particularly for the knee, you could be talking about mechanical alignment and people who are bow-legged or people who are, have like knock knees, they don't have like that neutral mechanical alignment, you know, they, they, they can have more of a predisposition for uh, cartilage issues or meniscal issues. And the meniscus are like the, this like wedge-shaped cartilages that are inside the joint that they can help disperse the, the force of gravity. 
Uh, if you get one of those torn, then that, can, that increases the risk of, uh, of, our, of arthritis to that joint. So, the, you know, when I looked at studies look, uh, that relate to diet, they mostly relate to uh, mechanisms of injury uh, or mechanisms of cartilage uh, de degradation. Uh, for instance, recently I saw one involving the uh, oxid uh, oxidized LDL, stimulating some receptors that induce uh, cartilage destruction of the joint. So, you know, that leads you to think, well, avoiding vegetable oils can help with that because uh, that's, you know, a mechanism that, um, that LDL can get oxidized. But how does that translate into real life, you know, whether somebody can prevent arthritis in the knee, it's, I think it remains to be seen, but it's certainly worth trying. Um, and, you know, and there are athletes that, you know, do have problems with arthritis. I, I, you know, I like to sprint and I competed on my first ever track meet, which was because I turned 50 years old, I was able to qualify. And, you know, and I met this sprinter, I don't know how old he is, but uh, he's definitely older than me. He's probably, I think maybe he was like in the 60 and up category and he was sprinting with a partial knee replacement, you know? And I'm like, wow, that's pretty aggressive, you know? So I know, you know, I can even tell you firsthand that a lot of these professional athletes, they, they end up have with, or, or, you know, collegiate athletes end up with arthritis. And back in the practice with, of the joint replacement surgeon that I used to work with decades ago, you know, I think he took care of some uh, former NFL players and, you know, their knees would be all beat up. So I think it's multifactorial, but, uh, you know, um, I think it's important that no matter whether the patient had or has a history of sports, pivoting activities or injury is, definitely worth a try to make dietary changes because it could make the difference between requiring a surgery or not surgery. It can make a difference between requiring or not requiring corticosteroid injections. Now the injections, they help a lot with pain, but they actually make their arthritis worse. <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, that's something that patients commonly get all the time. I mean, I give the injections, but I, give them, I, give, I tell them, look, this is good for pain, but this is not gonna help with anything else. It's gonna make your tissue worse. I do think they have their place. You know, a 95 year old grandma has got knee pain. She's not gonna get surgery. You know, just, you know, make her feel better, give her an injection and then she and she loves it. And then she comes back like several months later for another one. And I think that's fine. But the younger the patient is, you know, the more hesitant I am because uh, I, you know, now the literature is coming back saying that in patients who get steroid injections to a knee, their arthritis gets worse than on those patients who don't get the, the steroids. We already kind of knew that for the for the hip. And in I know I'm like going into different subjects here, but but you know, patients who get steroid injections to the hip, in some patients that that arthritis gets dramatically worse very quickly. Kind of hard to predict who on whom, and it's only a small percentage, but it, I I have seen it to the point where I, I don't even offer it. I don't refer them for a steroid injection to the hip uh, because it, it can happen. But for the knee, uh, I recently saw a study showing that, you know, looking at two cohorts and the people who get the steroid uh, injections, the, the, their arthritis gets worse as well. Maybe not to the extent as like patients with hip arthritis, but it still gets worse. So, you know, I think diet works. Uh, I can tell you anecdotally, I had a patient too. This is another story. I had a patient that I saw for a shoulder problem once. And she told me that, you know, years prior, they had told her that she needs a knee replacement and she was morbidly obese. Uh, they had discussed bariatric surgery and so forth. And she, and, but she decided to get the bariatric surgery first. Uh, and she did, lost the weight. And with that, all her pain went away on her knee. And then she only saw me some years later for some shoulder problem that was unrelated. Now, I mean, I'm not saying that bariatric surgery is like a fix all or anything like that. And they can have complications as well. Uh, but, you know, with the weight loss that she had, her knee pain went away. Even myself, I told her when I, when I lost 10 pounds, I noticed 
I notice a significant difference in my left knee, just from 10 pounds. Now, whether that's actually less weight or because I was decreasing like some sort of baseline inflammation, I don't know. Right. Probably both. Yeah. Always, uh, you know, yeah, it certainly I think is both. Uh, I just want to go back. Uh, I, I need to acknowledge that you're certainly the first orthopedic surgeon I've heard mentioned oxidized LDL and uh, how, how happy that <laughs> makes me to hear you talking about that. Well, but, I, I um, wanted I to, wanna, could, could, could I, I had a question about that, Phil, because yeah, definitely. I'm not a medical professional. Explain why this oxidized LDL is important and how that translates for us lay people. What does that mean for just day-to-day -day life? Yeah, so, you know, I, everyone will be familiar with LDL cholesterol because, you know, it is such a focus of our medical system. And um, oxidized LDL uh, cholesterol is basically a damaged form of uh, LDL cholesterol. These are damaged cholesterol particles. Um, oxidation, you know, uh, again, you know, to kind of translate that, um, rust is oxidation. Um, when you, if you have a bottle of, uh, you know, vegetable oil that you leave out on your counter and it goes rancid, uh, that's because it's getting oxidized. Um, so, you know, oxidation happens within our bodies. And there's lots of evidence that oxidized LDL is what, you know, contributes to heart disease. So it's not all LDL, it's only the damaged LDL that really seems to get trapped uh, within blood vessel walls and ends up uh, contributing to plaques and causes, uh, it is a, in and of itself, uh, uh, part of the inflammation process. So um, it, it uh, doesn't surprise me to hear that it's related to inflammation elsewhere in the body. Um, you know, besides the blood vessels. And, you know, again, uh, one of the problems that we maybe have with the LDL theory of disease is that, you know, the blood is circulating through our bodies and LDL cholesterol is always in our bloodstream, you know, so why isn't it causing problems, you know, all over the body? Why is it only in particular places in the blood vessels of the heart? Uh, and, you know, some of the evidence there is that it needs to be damaged first, uh, basically, to become problematic. And I think that goes along with what Carlos was talking about, uh, these oxidized LDL particles contributing to inflammation in, you know, uh, in joints, in uh, cartilage and uh, uh, contributing to arthritis as well. And what's the tie in with uh, seed oils? Uh, so uh, uh, seed oils, uh, you know, containing a high amount of polyunsaturated fatty acids are more prone to oxidation uh, because they're more uh, unstable. So the unsaturated uh, um, uh, portions of these fatty acids are where the oxidation occurs. Uh, and saturated fatty acids that, you know, occur in things like animal fat uh, don't oxidize. You know, you can leave because uh, they're stable, they're chemically because stable, they're stable. Yeah. So you okay. can leave, uh, you know, a thing of lard or a thing of beef tallow out on your counter and it's not going to go rancid, uh, whereas uh, vegetable and seed oils will. Okay. All right. I, I, I apologize for that, that little rabbit trail we went down, but Good I didn't diversion. understand this stuff. So I want to understand it. Yeah. I wanted to ask Carlos uh, his thoughts on, you know, uh, maybe, you know, if we look at sort of the other end of the uh, orthopedic spectrum uh, and look at children, and it seems, you know, that there's a definite uptick in uh children developing orthopedic problems, children getting, you know, these injuries, uh, requiring orthopedic surgeries. You know, I, I can just think uh, a number of my uh, daughter's friends have already had, you know, injuries that seem like didn't occur back when we were children, you know, 30, 40 uh, years ago. 
uh, there seems to be a noticeable intake, uh, uptick uh, in the uh, incidence of, of childhood orthopedic problems. And of course, we know that there's an uptick in uh, childhood metabolic uh, problems, uh, obesity and, and type 2 diabetes, for instance. And I was just wondering if you think those two are related, uh, because the, the mainstream economic explanation for this is that, oh, well, children are just, you know, they're doing sports year round and they're more active. Uh, and that's why they're getting injured more. Uh, but, it, you know, that doesn't really seem to be the case. If anything, children seem to be less active and they're getting injured more uh, is kind of uh, my observation. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, uh, to me, I think it for, for children is... Uh multifactorial and uh you know it, and it depends really what what kind of what injury we're talking about whether if it's a fracture or an acl tear or things like that uh, i do think there may be a component of diet with acl injuries but i think that you know maybe some people will burn me for saying this i, I think that contribution is probably minor uh and i know i've had, I've had some disagreements with, with tucker goodrich on this on, on twitter but uh, and I'm not saying that it, the contribution is zero. I would certainly think that the contribution of diet to rotator cuff tears of the shoulder in middle age and older adults is much higher. Like, you know, the, the, the relationship to diet than ACLs. Uh, there's so many factors involved. This is, and if we just stick to ACLs, you know, uh, I think it has to do with sports, the demand of sports, having demanding coaches, uh, you know, um, most patients I get ACL tears are women. And I think, you know, with a lot of women's sports that, you know, soccer, volleyball, they, they end up getting with the ACL tears. Most, uh, as far as, most of your ACL tears are women? Yeah. Like statistically significant difference? I believe so. I think, uh, I think I've, that's what I've seen. And, uh, and I think that's what I've, I've seen in practice. Maybe not so much when I was in the Navy because most people in the Navy, at least when I was in active duty, are men. But there is, there, they do have a higher rate of ACL, ACL tears than boys. So if you were to take like 100 collegiate athletes that are male and female, you're going to have more ACL tears in the, in the room. Various factors. I think it has to do with their cycle, with the anatomy, with the way that, you know, if they look at you know, how they jump or how they land, they can men, tend to land a little bit differently. It depends on the strength of the external rotators of the hip. There, there's so many factors involved. And uh, I mean, you could, you know, there are like whole lectures and probably even books written about this, but uh, I do think that maybe diet has something to do with it too as well. But I think, you know, the, the dietary changes have not taken effect like they do for, older folks who undergo like shoulder injuries. And that's where I can, I can almost exclusively put a blame on diet. Uh, as far as other things, um, you know, because I haven't seen, Philip, I haven't seen really many ACL tears for like kids that are not like active in some particular sport. Uh, what I see the injuries in children that are not particularly active uh, I think it tends to be similar problems that I might see when, in uh, in the older adults. You know, uh, maybe obesity may, may be one issue. Uh, maybe they trip and they fall, and they're not able to break their fall as easily. Um, and and I'm and I've seen more children too with you know metabolic diseases. And you know, I have diagnosed acanthosis nigricans in my office, which is uh, that's like a condition where you know, the, the skin of the, uh, of the joints gets a little bit darker, or you could have some darkness also happening around oh, the yeah. folds of the neck. Who was, now, we had another guest talking about that. I don't remember what, what what's that condition called again? Acanthosis nigricans. <laughs> okay. Nigricans basically meaning black. So it's like a darkening of, of the skin at the at joint surface. It could be here at the elbow, it could be at the knuckles. And, you know, and, and I think the common misconception of patients, they think, oh, I think that, I thought that was just dirt. Like I'm, my hands are dirty and, you know, I'm playing outside or whatever. I'm like, no, no, that's, that's, that's not dirt. That's just, you know, it's like increased pigmentation. And it, it, that's a precursor. Most 
I mean, there are various reasons, uh, causes for that, but most commonly it's a precursor for diabetes later on in life. So, you know, I've, I've told patients and their parents, you know, this is like an early warning sign, you know, to work on the diet, work making dietary changes. Uh, and it goes away once, you know, once that gets fixed, you know, the, the dark, darkening tends to go away. But I have seen I can those as nigricans in children that come into the office for like fractures, you know. Um, so those are the two things that I've noticed, though. So it's uh, basically your typical metabolic qualms occurring at a younger age and uh, and sometimes increase uh, sports injuries. But I, I think tend, those tend to be more related to uh, just the demand of the sport. And, you know, some kids are just doing like sports, you know, maybe the same sport trying to do it year round. And, you know, pitchers, you have them like, you know, throwing so many pitches and then they show up with like similar injuries. Uh, so, but certainly I've seen metabolic problems in the, in the kids in the office as well. Bill, did you have something <laughs> in mind when you asked that question? Well, you know, I was going to kind of uh, follow. I think this uh, leads us into, you know, you've uh, discussed um, the relationship of, uh, you know, diet and lifestyle and metabolic uh, disease to uh, osteoporosis, uh, kind of weakening of the bones. And, um, you know, I, I want to get into that. I uh, want to hear your perspective and have you explain that. Uh, but I'm also was, you know, wondering if uh children you know that are uh, not you know having a lot of processed food a lot of vegetable and seed oils in their diet you know if their bone uh growth their bone formation uh is affected by that and if that's one of the factors that make that seems to be making them more prone uh to uh injuries it could very well be, uh, but not something that I've closely looked at. I do know maybe about two, three years ago, uh, here in, in the US, they published a study looking at supplementing children with vitamin D. And I think in the results showed that it helped. I have seen more studies in terms of nutrition regarding vitamin D and protein uh, for children in India. Uh, but I have not noticed, for instance, like, you know, with weaker bone. I mean, and may, maybe perhaps the bone density is not as good as it should be. And that decreased bone density has seen me, but at least I haven't seen it. What is clear to me is the uh, markedly decreased bone density and that's the process of like some of my older patients. That is just so clear cut. It's like night and day. Uh, so now Jack had the question about well, what is osteoporosis. So yeah. osteoporosis is, a condition in which your bone uh, decreases on its density and it becomes more prone to fracture. Now, the quality, by definition, the quality of the bone is the same, but the quantity of it is decreased. <laughs> but I would add a caveat to this, that I would say the quality is not the same, but by the definition, the quality is the same, it's just that there's less of the bone. Why do I say the quality is not the same? Well, as we age, the quality of the bone decreases, even for somebody who may have good bone density. Uh, and uh, I think one of the primary ways that, it, that, that the quality of the bone decreases is through what we call advanced glycation and products. So basically what that is, is that you have proteins that get peppered by glucose molecules or other different molecules that attach to those proteins. And that uh, reaction doesn't require any enzymes. Uh, and it, over the long term, what it does, it, it makes the bone less ductile or less elastic, and it becomes more brittle. So, okay, so this uh, is this is uh, so glycose yeah, I'm kind or of confusing. So, for instance, well, hemoglobin A1C, which many people have heard. It's basically looking at advanced glycation of products in a red blood cell. Advanced so when you look at glycation in products, in products. So okay. now on a, on a red blood cell, you have Thank you. 
you have these glucose molecules basically attaching to like the hemoglobin. Uh, and that's when you, when you look at a hemoglobin A1C, you're looking to see how much of these like glucose molecules have attached to these hemoglobins uh, or to the red cells over a period of time, usually for the last few months. But the same process of that occurs in the red blood cells occurs in virtually every other tissue in the body, including bone, including the meniscus and the knee, including ligaments, including tendons. What that does to bone and what that does to ligaments and tendons, it makes them less elastic and more brittle. Okay, that affects you know, the incidence of fractures. On top of the front, oops, Whoa. I dropped the phone. Yeah, huh. I know this, I'm doing this from my phone. On top of the fact that, uh, you know, I, advanced vacation of products doesn't even factor into the diagnosis of osteoporosis. What factors into the osteoporosis is the decreased bone density. So if you have a patient with osteoporosis, now their bone density is lower. And because they're older, and maybe especially if they were diabetic, now their bone is less elastic and more brittle. Then you have more of a recipe for uh, for fracture after sure. a simple fall. Sure. Okay. And I think that's the explanation why patients with diabetes they tend to. Um, they may not even have osteoporosis, but yet they have a higher incidence of fractures than somebody who's not diabetic. Just, I, in my, I think it's because of the fact that the bone is more brittle, even if they don't have osteoporosis. Yes. Wow. Huh. And, and so most people, you know, when, they, uh, when their doctors talk to them about osteoporosis, you know, the recommendations are going to be around, you know, supplementing calcium or getting enough calcium in your diet uh, because the perception, I guess I'll say, is that, you know, our bone is made up of mostly calcium. Uh, that's kind of the common uh, misconception, really, uh, even amongst doctors. Uh, so what, what advice do you have for people that, uh, you know, have osteoporosis and they're trying to stop it from getting worse or, you know, trying to improve it? Well, uh, very quickly, I mean, I guess I could talk hours on this, but, uh, well, first of all, we look at their diet because uh, bone is about, dry bone is about 40% protein. So protein makes up a significant portion of this. And there are studies that looked at calcium and vitamin D that don't even show that they make a real difference. And it's not because we don't need the calcium. It's not because we don't need the vitamin D. In fact, most people are deficient on vitamin D. So we definitely need vitamin D. But I think it's kind of just looking at the wrong way. To me, build, uh, making bone or trying to at least slow down that process of losing bone, it's like building a house, okay? You got to have all, all the ingredients in there. You cannot just take a cement truck or a concrete truck, I guess, and just dump more concrete on the on the on the building site and expect to get a bigger house out of it or more houses. You gotta have all the ingredients. You gotta have your wires, you know, you gotta have your plumbing material, you gotta have uh, you know everything that you need, you know, the sand, the gravel, whatever. You need to have everything. And and I think that's where a lot of these studies may miss the point where they say, well, we're gonna look at calcium. Oh, calcium doesn't work. As a matter of fact, I think some studies show that, you know, supplementing postmenopausal women with calcium, all it does is that it increases the incidence of calcification of their arteries and the soft tissues. You know, um, that doesn't mean that we don't need the calcium, but, you know, you just like taking it, just one in, increasing one ingredient and you're expecting a house to, to be built and it doesn't work that way. So I think what people need to focus is, well, Look at their diet. Make sure you kind of clean it up. Cut the sugars, these grains for uh, refined carbohydrates, the vegetable oils. Focus on protein because bone is going to be 40% protein. Okay. And mostly it's going to be type 1 collagen. Uh, and uh, 
And then I will focus, uh, and the nutrients that I would tend to focus would be vitamin D, vitamin K2, which is important. Basically, K2 tells the calcium to go to the bone and not go to you know, these other soft tissues. And K2 only comes from animal sources with the exception of natto, you know, fermented soybean. But it's not the soybean what has the K2. It's the bacteria that are fermenting the soybean, the ones that are making the K2. Uh, but you can also get it from, you know, the egg yolks and you know, beef liver and things like that. Uh, and then I'll tell them to focus on magnesium too. Uh, so with, now I, I tell patients, if you're gonna supplement calcium, then you should supplement in all these three. I don't have any evidence that that's the way it would work, but I certainly would not recommend supplementing calcium alone or supplementing calcium with only vitamin D because more likely than not, it's not gonna work or it can lead to calcification of blood vessels. And, you know, so we don't want that. So, uh, but it will be interesting to see if by supplementing those four that you can actually help increase the bone density. The other thing that can help increase the bone density, just like it will help with building a house, is that you gotta pay your contractors. You can just tell like, you know, the osteoblast, you know, just make more bone and not really pay them. I mean, you can tell the construction workers to just build a house and not pay them or not offer them, you know, money or incentives for it. And the incentives to make bone in, uh, come from doing uh, weight bearing exercises, strength training, okay? So some studies have looked at, you know, people who are in bed rest, for instance, and at a hospital, if you are on bed rest, like not getting up, not moving around in a hospital for 10 days, your lower extremities will lose already 10% of their lean body weight, of the lean oh, weight. Lord. Just from inactivity. Wow. That, I mean, and, and that's just the lean. Not, I'm not including whatever fat you might have had burned during that time, just loss of lean mass, but basically muscle and bone from inactivity. So, you know, doing strength training, doing strengthening exercises is basically like saying, hey, we'll give you, we'll give you the osteoblast, you know, this amount of money. And then once you meet these certain milestones, we'll keep paying you. That's gotta be the incentive. You gotta, you gotta pay your workers. And you do it through Love strengthening that metaphor. exercises. That's, yeah. That's a powerful metaphor. You it can't just isn't. you can't just dump concrete on the on the the plot and hope that a house builds and you got to pay your workers and that's good that's really good. Um, yeah, and you know what what amazes me about you know those recommendations that you just gave is that they are basically the same recommendations that I give to people who say how do I minimize this calcification that's occurring in my arteries and this plaque that's building in my arteries? And, you know, I tell them you want your vitamin D and your K2 because you want that K2 to get that calcium out of the walls of your blood vessels and into your bones where it belongs. Um, and of course, you know, eating protein and, and uh, magnesium and eliminating the vegetable and seed oils and the processed food and the sugar, you know, uh, all the things that uh, we recommend. So um, it, it's not not surprising to anyone who's really thinking about it that, you know, what helps your heart should help your bones uh, and the rest of your body as well. Absolutely. And, and even one factor that I, that I didn't get to, which I need to get to, because I think it's very important, it's their medications. So yeah. uh, you, you, you said something about chronic medication yes. um, it, in, our, in our prep for the show. And I'd never heard that phrase used before. Well, you know, I think so many of our medical conditions are just created by as side effects or adverse reactions of medications that we take for something else. And it's just a vicious cycle. So there are two, uh, well, I'll get into maybe three types of medications. And there, there's, there's actually quite a few, but for osteoporosis, what under my own, my own observation, the, the biggest culprit medication wise are the PPIs, the proton pump inhibitors. Those are Proton-pump the anti-acids. Yep. Those are like your 
your antiacids that are uh, protein inhibitors like omeprazole, lansaprazole, you know, prilosec, uh, you know, those, and which used to be by prescription, now they're like just over the counter. And I would say almost all of my patients with osteoporotic fractures, you know, like osteoporotic, like hip fractures is almost all of them or the great majority of them are on pronoun pump inhibitors. Wow. The ironic thing is they get admitted to the hospital and then, and then the, the hospital is still orders more of the, of, of the pronoun pump inhibitor, you know? And I tell patients, you know, I think this is probably the biggest reason why you have this fracture. I, I even had a patient that, you know, he's a, he's a cattle farmer. He rides horses. Uh, he's not obese. Uh, you know, he looks pretty good for his age. And, and yet he came in from with a hip fracture that just happened because he was just simply squatting down and he just kind of twisted. He was not home in any weights. He just barely twisted a little bit, cracked the bone. And then, you know, get I'm getting the history and I'm looking at the x-rays. He had a similar problem like two years before on the other hip. Like he also had another fracture. The other one was fixed with a nail. For this one, I had to do a replacement of the hip. And, you know, digging from the history, and he's not a smoker and he's not on steroids. And I will also add to this that steroids, chronic use of steroids is very bad for, for osteoporosis. You know, patients are on like on prednisone, you know, for long term mm -hmm. and things like that. Uh, but, you know, his only risk factor was, uh, Proton pump inhibitors, and it's like how long you've been taking them. And it's like, woo, um, you know, I've been taking them for like years. Yeah, you know, and he already had a hip fracture like two years prior. So proton pump inhibitors are just a bad actor, and you know, and something that there's already, you know, people on social media are very active saying that, uh, and that actually now there's some evidence that is published is that in low carbohydrate diets. A lot of people with their acid reflux goes away, or at least it gets better. So, but you know, I, I can testify to that personally. I, I, <laughs> when I, whenever I get acid reflux, it is almost a hundred percent guaranteed that um, I've had too many carbs, and it goes yeah. away with if yeah, I just and... you know have a big old hunk of meat and slathered slathered some butter on it and life's better that way I swear. Exactly. so monopop inhibitor is definitely a problem um another one that i would this one i've been looking into it more recently and i don't know how strong the data is but there's definitely an association between statins and tendon ruptures uh and i cannot even say that the orthopedic community has not known about this, at least some people have, because one of the studies that I looked at was actually published in JBJS, the Journal, journal of Bone and Joint Surgery, which is like the premier journal for orthopedics, you know, years ago, uh, finding an association between these statins and tendon ruptures. And I can say that, you know, for probably a good portion of patients that I see with tendon ruptures, including on the shoulder, like rotator cuff tears, you know, that they are taking some form of statin for their cholesterol. So that's something else to, to be careful of. And of course, like I mentioned, steroids are not good. Uh, they're not good for healing. They're not good for bone density. Uh, sometimes people are on steroids for some, you know, whatever autoimmune disorder it might be though, but they have to understand that they do have the risks. Then uh, some diabetes medications can lead to osteo osteoporosis too. Um, and uh, neuroleptics can do it too. I had Neuro a patient. Neuroleptics? Neuroleptics. So like antipsychotics uh, or medications for people with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or what have you. And just about two months ago, I had a patient who has a history of schizophrenia and she's been on, you know, uh, medication for that for years. And I mean, she was younger than me and she just had like a little simple twist and fall while going to the bathroom and he had a severely comminuted fracture of the tibia, of the tibia plateau, meaning that she had like an osteopenic or osteoporotic fracture. The bone density was not good at all. The fracture was in many pieces at the level of the joint, of the knee joint. It was basically like taking care of a fracture of somebody who's like 
80 or 90 years old, mm. even though she was in her like early 40s. And, you know, the only thing that I can attribute it to that is from her medications for her schizophrenia. So that's why, that's why I mean by chronic medications, because we really have to dig deeper into uh, what causes some of the conditions people get. And sometimes you don't even have to go as far as diet, although we should be evaluating everybody's diet. But sometimes the answer is the medications that they're taking. Well, we are closing in on an hour here, and I've got a couple other questions that I'm, I really want to want to ask you. Um, I I always research our our guests before they appear, and I was stalking you on Twitter, and uh, I see this these photos of various plates of food. Um, what, if I may ask, is tripe? Well, it's one of the, uh, I think, you know, the ruminants were like, you know, things like cows, they have like, uh, I think it's four chambers or like four different stomach chambers. And then, so the honeycomb tribe is like one of them. Uh, you're basically eating like some sort of intestinal wall. Uh, it's, I know it sounds disgusting, but, and people say that it smells bad, but it's actually delicious to be honest with you. You just have to make sure it's very well rinsed. I cook it in, in steak fat with lard with some bacon on it. Uh, it's very chewy, definitely very chewy, but it's chewy because it has a lot of collagen. So, and, and collagen is good. It's good, uh, it's good for many reasons. You know, it, I think it adds some benefits that you don't get from just eating pure red meat uh, because the collagen is gonna be high in glycine and there are all these studies showing glycine you know, can expand the lifespan of like animals and things like that. Plus, it's, it's an important component of collagen. And collagen is in our bones, in our joints, in our blood vessels. Uh, so, yeah, that's what tripe is. I, 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 at least the way I cook it is so good. I've had it for like eight days in a row, you know, at times. So, I, I that, can that's what confirm tripe is. You've, you've publicly testified on your Twitter feed how much you love <laughs> tripe. <laughs> I always thought it was a fish, so I'm glad I asked the question. All right, that leads me to the follow-up question, which is talk about the nutritional function of organs as a food. Um, we talk about protein in general, um, and then we tend to think of meat. But what about what about organs? How what's the nutritional benefit of consuming organs? as opposed to just the muscle of animals? Uh, I think there are benefits, you know, um, maybe Sean Baker makes a, Dr. Baker makes a good point that perhaps are not necessary and he does not eat organs, but uh, I think that there's benefits you can get from them, uh, especially if you can actually enjoy them. Now, for, for tribe and for other organs, it may be the benefit of collagen. Now, uh, the most common, amino acid and the amino acids are the building block of proteins and the most common amino acid in collagen is going to be glycine you know now glycine is not an essential amino acid meaning that we can make it ourselves but it is thought that perhaps we don't make make it to an optimal amount and so it's probably better to include it in our diet uh, some studies show at least for animals that you know glycine supplementation can expand life lifespan uh, I don't know how that would translate to just eating a bunch of uh, tripe for a human, but it could certainly help. Uh, then other organs like liver, they can, you know, they're just going to be packed with a lot of nutrients, you know, including vitamin D, um, vitamin A, and so forth. And so I think they can be very helpful. I think they can help more quickly optimize health in some patients. Uh, patients already have like a clean diet and they're eating pastured eggs. Uh, and they're eating, you know, wild-caught seafood like salmon or so forth. I'm not so sure how much they will benefit from it uh, or if it's just like almost like overkill. But I, I do recommend eating organ meat uh, or at least the ones that people will actually enjoy. You know, I, I'll be honest with you. I tried kidney once just for the jiggles of it. Uh, it didn't really taste very good. And I tried it the second time and then I'm like, that's it. I think I'm done with kidney. I'm not trying this again. Very cheap, but you know, when I asked the butcher at the supermarket, he's like, "Oh yeah, people buy it. They they feed them to their dogs." 
Yeah, well, dogs lick themselves. their own butts, so, you know. Exactly. But, you know, there's a big difference between tribe and kidney. And there's a big difference between, like, sweet breads, which has nothing to do with bread, and, and kidney. So there are some organs out there, like tripe and sweet breads, that I, I truly find enjoyable. And I would go to a restaurant, to, like, a, a steakhouse. You know, you know I've, several times I've ordered at this particular Argentinian steakhouse in Miami, sweet breads, and I enjoy them. So... Uh, I think they have benefits, uh, you know, whether absolutely necessary, probably not, but I, th I think it can help particularly those patients that are coming up from a poor diet to get optimized more quickly. Very good. Yeah, I'll, I'll certainly endorse uh, eating heart and uh, sweet breads I'm a fan of as well. Uh, the, the liver and the kidney, uh, a little, little rough. I usually get it uh, mixed into some ground beef, uh, to do that. Uh, and I haven't tried tripe as of yet. I'll have to get that on the list. Well, I just got, I just got tripe today, <laughs> but I had to ask for it at the supermarket though. That's, that's good to know because one of my follow-up questions was going to be, how the heck do you get it? So they have it at the supermarket, apparently. All right, Phil, are there any questions we have less, left unanswered here? No, just uh, or unasked. Guess, you know, maybe, yeah, wrap up by uh, talking about how you're sort of integrating this into your uh, professional life, life these days and where people can uh, connect with you and find you. Yeah, uh, so the way I integrate this into orthopedic practice is basically I have my instructions on nutrition and I have also additional instructions on bone health. So a lot of these things that we discussed about cutting sugars, cutting car, uh, excessive carbs and, you know, and greens and vegetable oils and include these things in the diet, all those things I have in just two sheets of paper that I give to my patients. And, you know, as you know, we only get about seven minutes with each patient, but I try to make the most out of it. Uh, even if it's just involved, just discussing diet and, and nutrition, even if it's just for one minute. Uh, some patients are receptive to it, some of them are not, you know, that's just kind of the way it goes. Um, I can be reached uh, mainly on Twitter. Uh, my handle is Moreira Ortho, M-O-R-E-Y-R-A-O-R-T-H-O. -E so my last name and Ortho. Uh, and I'm active on Twitter and I tend to you know, answer questions and, and post uh, interesting articles as I see them. And we'll post those things on our show notes so folks will be able to just click on those links and follow them. All right. Well, Dr. Carlos Morea, thank you for being with us today. I love it when we get surgeons because I know absolutely nothing about what you guys do other than use knives and cut people open. And it's really fun to find people who are working to not do the job that they trained so highly for even though it's essential. It's, I think, I think people like this, like I, it's one of the reasons I love working with Dr. O it gives your words far more weight that, that if people actually follow your advice, you will have less business. Mm -hmm. And that's to me that, that just reeks of credibility and I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Well, well, thank Phil, you for both of you to having me. It's good to have you. All right, well, another good one. Any last words for us, Phil? Just uh, eat real food and take back control of your health. We Absolutely. should probably make that a, 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 our, our tagline. Eat real food, take control of your health. All right, well, for Dr. Carlos Morea and Dr. Philip Ovedia, I'm Jack Heald. This is the Stay Off My Operating Table podcast, and we will talk to you all next time. America is fat and sick and tired. 88% of Americans are metabolically unhealthy and at risk of a sudden heart attack. Are you one of them? Go to ifixhearts.co and take Dr. Ovedia's metabolic health quiz. Learn specific steps you can take to reclaim your health, reduce your risk of heart attack, and stay off Dr. Ovedia's operating table.